GPT-4 came out in March of 2023. And ChatGPT really refers to the interface, which is what came out on November 30th. ChatGPT or the GPT LLMs, the models, existed all the way going back to 2018. She left in order to start a company in Silicon Valley. I remember back at that time, I was, I think we were all like, wow, this is hilarious. <laughs> Hey, what's going on, everybody? Today is November 29th, 2024. You're listening and watching the Daily AI Show live. And because today is the 29th and the 30th falls tomorrow, we are celebrating the ChatGPT that most of us know and love today. It actually turns two. So with us today to talk all about that and get over our Thanksgiving hangover here in the States from all the uh, delicious turkey day burritos that everybody clearly ate, uh, we have Beth, Jumi, Andy, and um, Brian. We'll see if uh, Carl pops in the door or not. He may or not be here today. I'm not sure. Um, but okay, so let's set the table here a little bit as we get into today's conversation. We actually had a call. We had a uh, show just like this a year ago on the uh, 30th talking about ChatGPT turning one. So what do we mean by turning one or in this case, turning two this year? Okay, so on November 30th, in simple terms, that's when the ChatGPT with the chat interface and the human-like conversation interface that we have all loved over the last two years. It's the one that had a million use users within two months. They hit all the, it broke records, all this stuff. Jimmy shaking his head. Yeah, we'll get into like some of those records and things that it, it did. And Andy, not too long ago, shared a graph talking about where it, it clearly has not slowed down. If anything, it's sped up its ascent into uh, the top tier LLM out there. So we're going to talk about that today. So, but just to set the table. Okay, ChatGPT or the GPT LLMs, the models, existed all the way going back to 2018. And so that's when you had like GPT-1. But it was built for different purposes. It, it, they were already working on um, the language models. They were working on the transformer model. But it wasn't until a bit later that they specifically used it to try to use it for a more human chat interface. And there's some really interesting things that happen that I actually have coming up in the newsletter uh, this Sunday. So plug for the newsletter, sign up. It's free. It goes out every Sunday. And I'm telling you, I have a cool breakdown, a sort of, we always do a, did you know? There's a cool breakdown of, of ChatGPT and that did you know? So there's a little bit of plug. If you want to see what that is, you got to go to the newsletter because I'm not going to reveal it here on the show. There's also a very cool breakdown from something that Andy shared. So go to the dailyishow.com, sign up for the newsletter. If you sign up today, tomorrow, you're going to get the next episode. It's our the next edition, which is I think number 26 now. Uh, it'll hit your inbox at 8 a.m. Eastern on Sunday. So do that and go check that out. So there's some really cool history here, but that's what we're talking about when we say it's turn two. No, not that it didn't exist prior to that, but this is when it went generally available to the public. And this is where we saw the meteoric rise. Both Dolly 2 at the time and ChatGPT, what? It was three or 3.5 at the time? Three? What, what went? It was three, right? And then 3.5 came out pretty quickly thereafter? Okay. So there you go. There's my quick background. You guys are going to add more to this, but I just wanted to set the table because I thought immediately we'd have people being like, Meh, you're wrong. You know, it's not the two year anniversary because I used it in 2019. Yes, you probably did, but most of us did not. So that's what we're talking about. <laughs> and also go bullets, but go ahead. And ChatGPT really refers to the interface, which is what came out on November 30th. Like we're not saying that LLMs didn't exist before uh, then, but it is the conversational chat that was responsible for like the the giant uh, meteoric rise, right? Um, uh, so it uh, was um, the largest, fastest time to one million users. Uh, it hit one million users in five days at the time, which was December uh, 5th, 2022. Since then, circumstances have happened and other things have uh, eclipsed that in a smaller amount of time. But um, but yeah, and, and when you look across the LLM, um, when you look across the, the ones that are dominant, the chat ones that are dominant now, uh, the dates are wild. Like there was nothing 
for a while. I forgot how how much, um, yeah, how much time went by before like Claude came out, Bard initial launch, right? I mean, uh, again, we've talked about it before, but Bard, like, how were you not ready? <laughs> think think also about how much time passed from the time that OpenAI was founded with a mission to uh, you know start the charge towards a, a, a artificial general intelligence and when chat gpt came out and made all of that front page news that's you know like open ai was founded 10 years ago now right Been around for 10 years yeah it was amazing right so and agi at the time was like um uh like bat shit pie in the sky kind of thing. yeah yeah maybe right? maybe next century who knows you know so, so I just wanted to do a quick like bullet point list of like some of the highs, high, highs and lows, uh, you know, over the last couple of years. And uh, like Beth said, million users in five days. That's incredible. But a hundred million in two months. Right. That, I mean, what, what is that? A hundred, hundred X in, in 60 days. That's, that's crazy. Right. Um, and then, uh, they get 4 billion monthly website visits, making it in the top 10, uh, most visited websites in the world. Bigger than Amazon, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's, what, that's, that is the echelon that we're talking about. Amazon, that's Google, you know, every, every day websites people use that are probably not even in their mind, right? That, uh, that they, they have gone from. Uh, you know, the end of 2022 to now. Um, can I, can I ask a caveat on that, Jimmy, real quick yeah. before you go on? Cause I'm curious, is that people going and logging into chat GPT? That's literally the website chat GPT or even maybe chat.com. Correct. That's not including API calls. Uh, correct. Correct. That's going to their website. Yeah. Which is amazing, which is also amazing. Cause that's not even the full force. You may be able to get into it, but I just wanted to clarify that we're not talking about all uses of GPT 4.0, right? You know, 3.5 or 01 or whatever. We're saying this is literally people going to a website that's not Google, not Amazon, lo either logging in or using the free side because you can use it without logging in now and using it. So I just want to clarify that really quick because clearly, once you add API, we get that that's a whole different number, you know. Sure, sure. How many rappers there are out there now that have considerable, you know, uh, traffic? Each one of them maybe not even comparable to what OpenAI is doing directly with ChatGPT, which mm -hmm. is chat.openai.com. Right. But in aggregate, all of those together represent an enormous flow of demands on the inference centers that OpenAI has had to build. And I'm amazed actually that even to get to the 100 million users in two months, they already had the scalable data centers ready to run that and do it reliably. I never really had any period of time when I felt that OpenAI didn't respond quickly to, mm. to, to whatever I needed it to do. I've had it go down and I don't want to get away from Jimmy's numbers here because we're getting off the, the bullet points, but uh, I've definitely had it go down. I will tell you, they oftentimes in retrospect seem to be linked with some update from OpenAI. So it just happened to me the other day and I was like, oh, it's acting really weird. My coworker wrote me and she's like, where did all the GPTs go? And we went into this frantic of they disappeared. Like they just weren't on the screen. She's like, I can't find them. Where are they? I was like, one. Happy to hear you using our GPTs internally. That's great. To let me go see if I can help you find these. Well, that was the same 24 hour period where we later on X, they came out and they said, oh, we just improved the conversational, not the conversational, like the writing ability of ChatGPT. That was all within that 24 hours. And so I, I find that to happen over and over again, that if I see some huge downturn, it usually corresponds with some sort of update to the main infrastructure on there. But yeah, just wanted to point it out. But Jimmy, I'm sorry. I feel like I got you off track here. No, 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 no. I mean, I've got a lot of factoids. Uh, yeah, yeah, drop for it. So no problem. Uh, but before then, the first factoid uh, I want to drop is Aaron's with us. What's up? Hi. Hi, I thought I'd pop in at the last minute. Sorry, I'm a bit late. <laughs> Great to see you, man. It's an important show like this one. 
And I, I was need to say this and pointed out that that Aaron is not it's not just Aaron is joining us. So, so Beth and I are joining on the East Coast. It's it's 10 a.m. Eastern for us. Jimmy, Andy, West Coast, it's 7 a.m. Now, even that I feel like I although I would do okay with 7 a.m., that's already an ask, right? They're having to get up and do the show first thing. Aaron, what time is it for you right now? It is currently eleven minutes past eleven PM. <laughs> In Perth, Australia. So you know, when Aaron shows up, we all get super excited because we all think to ourselves, no way I want to do this show at 11. <laughs> so, or I'm glad that you're near for a competition. Anyway, keep going, guys. Awesome. Okay, so a couple more. Let's talk about the GPT versions themselves. So GPT-4 came out in March of 2023. All right, so what's that? That's like four months after launch. Mm -hmm. Right. And then um, 4.0 came out in May of 2024. Mm -hmm. So a little more than a year after 4. And then, of course, uh, 4.0 Mini came out in July of 20, July of 2024. So, you know, just the fact that about three or four months after they launched, they had their big launch and everything like that, they came out with an entirely new model. And uh, anyone who's used the difference between GPT 3.5 and 4 sees what saw a huge marked difference. Sure. Like, I mean, I I did. Like, the difference between the two are, are were incredible. And then being able to see that same kind of jump between 4 and 4.0 in about another year. So, this kind, the, these kinds of advancements... Um, sort of led to the pattern of having the the autumn uh release news right and this is kind of what we're always looking for this time period it's like oh it's september anything could happen now in the ai world because everybody seems to relate uh you know release it in the fall so those are some of the big uh models uh, we saw mobile apps for ios come out in may of 2023 and Android in July of 2023. So they were quick on the, the mobile release as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also saw one of the more recent uh, releases is at October of this year when we saw Search GPT uh, release. Did you, mention, did you mention Code Interpreter in July of uh, 2023? Uh, no, but, uh, but Andy just well, That was a major, a major addition to Chat GPT's capability. And originally it seemed like, okay, this is going to allow us to put a file in and have it do analysis of that file. But the name code interpreter, and it changed to something else, data analysis after a while, but code interpreter yep, is the language of coding. And what, what it was doing with data analysis was it was taking uh, the information in and then using coding. Day, it was r running a Python program to do the analysis of the thing in the background. And that's what Code Interpreter was doing. That was a major advance in ChatGPT. Oh, absolutely. That's where we also yeah. first got to see how, uh, basically a glimpse of how uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT were going to approach handling new features. Literally build the feature as needed and then bring you back to your uh, to your conversation or your experience. Yeah, and that's sort of been the you know the methodology since then. It's worth bringing up too because let's remember when we first got access to ChatGPT to your, both your points, it was just the chat interface. There was no ability to create images. There was in, in the in the chat interface. I'm saying there's no ability to do code interpreter. Um, these were all standalone things like before we had plugins, before we had custom GPTs, and then we're sort of seeing the future of what the custom GPTs are going to be. But, you know, what we've seen over these two years, and I would say really in the last year, I feel like OpenAI has really actually done a pretty good job about being open and honest with some of the things that Sam Altman has said, but also uh, Mira and other people that maybe not even at the company anymore, where they were like, look, we're trying to become this one-stop shop we already have millions of people who use our website i think and they bought chat and they didn't we find out they bought chat.com or something like that yeah that's the same yes um so they own chat.com and paid whatever they paid millions probably for those naming rights or whatever and so they want to be a one-stop shop and they do tend to take these outside builds 
and then say, well, in time, you can expect that to be rolled into the main product, which is the chat GPT. And it's, and it should be like worth noting really quick too, that Beth, I think you said it. I think Beth, you were the one who said it at the top of the show. Chat GPT is a specific purpose built, friendly, user friendly interface for using the, the LLM, the model. We know this because we've had access to what they call the playground for a long time. And the playground is still really phenomenal. I'm so glad they never shut that down because um, some people may feel that it was, excuse me, antiquated or maybe out of date. And it's absolutely not because you can play with things like temperature control, a la, you know, creativity, as well as some other P values and things like that, that are really interesting context or um, uh, token length and things like that, um, which there is a definitive difference when you write the same prompt between the playground, which is just using the API versus ChatGPT, you do see a difference because ChatGPT is, is sort of meant to hit the middle. It's like the difference between owning an Android phone and an Apple. 99% of the time, the cool stuff is going to come out on the Android phone, sometimes up to two to three years later, right up until the point that a Apple says they invented it and puts it on their phone. And I'm an Apple phone user. I mean, I have an Apple phone, iPhone. So like I, but they like, listen, that's their, that's their, that's their pattern, right? Like we have this new amazing thing and all Android people raise their hands and go, we've had this for two years on our, on our Samsung or whatever, right? So Android, your favorite hobby, like the idea of putting all this stuff together and making it a, a simple interface. And with that, I've, I've run into this a thousand times with the custom GBT. You definitely lose flexibility. You definitely lose flexibility. I can't go in and, and tweak all the things like I can on an Android phone in an Apple iPhone to a certain extent. But what I'm trading for is easier user interface because my whole family does. And I've joked about this on the, on the show before and said, I don't want to have to fix my wife's phone and my daughter's phone. I want everybody to have the same thing. So when somebody says this isn't working, there's only, it's the same screen for everybody in the house, but I trade flexibility. And so it's just important to remind everybody that when you use ChatGPT, you are you are making a trade. You're saying, I'm okay with having to stay inside these guardrails, a set or maybe a variable uh, temperature reading that I cannot control. I can't tell ChatGPT to act. I can say act a little more creative, be, be more silly, and maybe that'll bring into it. But for the most part, that's set on the back end and hard baked into the way ChatGPT is. And there's there's a trade off there, you know? So that's why some people really love, prefer working, working with APIs. And some, and they're hoping the vast majority of the audience of the of the public is going to be totally fine with the day to day workings of ChatGPT, and that's why they keep rolling in these new things. They've already told us that O1 Preview will eventually be O1, and O1 will eventually be rolled directly into ChatGPT. We already know this to be the case. It's just a matter of how long it'll take to do that. So I'll stop talking there, but like I just wanted to bring that up as a as a difference maker, right? Well. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, that it it makes sense to highlight again is that Chat G the response to ChatGPT su surprised them, right? The yeah. reason there wasn't a big like rollout. This is an amazing tool for you is because they didn't think it was an amazing tool for you. Like they yeah. didn't. Uh, there hadn't been big. Um, uh, like there hadn't been a big sea change with any of their previous things. Um, or releases, although I think um, I think Dolly, when Dolly started to come out and upgraded from Dolly 1 to Dolly 2, that was a significant enough upgrade that for people who were in that camp, um, and I actually was in that camp, um, that was an interesting, like, oh, wow, you know, now you can even see that it's kind of a face, right? Like, this is amazing. Um, uh, it's it still didn't look like uh, there were still problems. Those faces were slightly nightmarish. But if we look back on like, yeah, that they didn't know either, right? Yeah. And interesting enough, Andy, you mentioned uh, Code Interpreter. Code Interpreter comes out of not an advancement of 3 to 3.5 to 4.0. Code Interpreter comes out of 2. Because that's, they were working through, um, what's it called? RLHF, you know, uh, reinforcement learning for human feedback, right? That's a big part of how some, not all, some models are trained and enhanced. And that was a big part of the earlier way that they looked to this. And 
that's a really interesting fact to me that, oh, they were purpose building these GPT models to do specific things, coding or other specific use cases. And it wasn't until after that, that they tried to do like the more human interface conversational chat that we all now know. But that's not to say that these other things didn't exist prior to that. Or to your point, Jimmy, like they quickly came out with 3.5. Well, obviously that was already there. That was already the leap for them internally must have been fairly easy for them to say, oh, hold on. We just got 2 million people in two days or 5 million people in two days. Oh, we have 100 million people in two months. Yeah, let's shift our focus towards this thing. And could be said also that that was the major sea change for them internally to how they wanted to organize their company from a strictly nonprofit to a profit model under the umbrella of a nonprofit. And we know in 2025, probably because of wanting to get more investing money, billions upon billions in investing money from people like Microsoft and BlackRock and others, that they actually are going to reorganize to better position themselves for part of it being for profit because they need to be able to continue to get massive amounts of money to continue to iterate, build data centers, all the above. So it's just interesting that that I am sure not only did it catch them off guard, Beth, and surprise, but also like, what, what do you do when you find a gem like that? And you're like, what do we do? What do we do? Do we keep going in this direction? It seems like it's really ca catching on. It must have been a really, really interesting and divisive time to be at OpenAI during those couple of months. I, I can't imagine. It must have been really interesting to be in some of those internal meetings um, where people were talking internally about, did we just catch lightning in a bottle and do we ride it? Or do we just let it be a flash and continue on with our mission? Yeah, it's interesting. That that that's a great uh, great highlight, uh, which uh, allows me to pivot to the second part of my list, which is some of the stumbles and challenges. So governance is a huge one. Yeah, you pointed out a a, a, a huge huge uh, stumble or you know a speed bump, so to speak, while they're figuring it out. Uh, it was such a tumultuous uh, transition period that uh, we even got uh, one of our uh, biggest stories that we've seen is the Sam Altman uh, firing and rehiring drama that happened in 72 hours. Like, yeah, over Thanksgiving, basically, last year. Yeah, basically. Yes, exactly. Over Thanksgiving yes. weekend. So it's, I mean, in the AI field, apparently everything happens quickly. You know, you could see similar things happen, like it happened with Apple and Steve Jobs decades ago. It happened over 10 years as opposed to three days. But, you know, those kinds of things do happen. Um, but yeah, so so if I got to say anything, a, the AI field, everything's just faster. You know how everything in Texas is bigger? Uh, everything's faster in AI. Yeah, as a result of that, uh, you know, Sam Altman probably has the very shortest tenure as a C-level executive at Microsoft ever. It was yeah, right. It was, the eight, it was the day after he was removed as the CEO of OpenAI that he was announced as the chief AI officer of Microsoft. Yeah. Okay. So it was like, whoa, that guy just jumped from a little startup. Oh yeah, an important startup, but boom. Yeah. Now he's a C level executive at Microsoft. And then four days later, he's back at OpenAI. Yeah. Also, can we just uh, can we we can we imagine for a second that Sam and his husband, and I think I don't think they have a child yet. I know they said they were they were uh they had maybe a child on the way, but anyway, him and his husband, do you think there's like PTSD around Thanksgiving now every year where it's just like I just want to, maybe if we could just have a, a quiet meal together and uh, <laughs> just keep it really low key for the weekend. Cause I think I would be like, I think for the rest of my life, Thanksgiving and stress would be interlocked together because of like what happened. And we kept saying me, I remember me and Carl going back and forth on Slack last year and saying, this is going to be all fixed by Thanksgiving. And it was, we started hearing inner workings and they're like, they're trying to get this all smoothed out. So that everybody at OpenAI who signed what there was 500 signatures or something like that of people who said they're going to walk. Mm. 
do you could imagine that people like don't know if they have a job going into? And of course, Microsoft said, in theory, we will hire all of you, you know, and so you have a new job if you want it. But can you imagine not just Sam and jokingly, but all those families that were affected through ripples of that whole situation right before a Thanksgiving break last year? So, I mean, not just Sam, but probably anybody who went through that, who was just a engineer, you know, not in the biggest meanings, but an engineer at OpenAI and how they must feel this year compared to last year when they were probably going home to their husbands and wives and saying, I don't know if I have a job, but also let's go to your in-laws for Thanksgiving meal. <laughs> it just, that's a lot. That's a lot for anybody to handle. So uh, much smoother this year. No drama over the Thanksgiving break whatsoever that I saw, unless it was internal, obviously. Uh, Aaron, you were about to visit. Go ahead. To sort of quickly jump in. So I remember back at that time, I was, I think we were all like, wow, this is hilarious, but wild and crazy. And I commented to my partner, Michelle, that this is like, she loves the, the, the housewife shows and they're all just drama city fighting left, right and center and carry on. I said, this is like a housewife show for the, the ultra tech geek community. It was so funny. So I'm glad they got it all sorted out though. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> Gave off plenty to talk about for a week. We listen, we we all, I mean, we talked about it on the show. It was a highly, it was one of our high, most highest ranked shows was like, what's going on with Sam or something like that. I remember that. Um, so from a user, a viewer standpoint, it was big for us early on because we were only like, what, four months into making the show at that point, something like that. Um, so it was a, it was big for our show. I mean, I know we got some subscribers off of, of that sort of, like you said, real housewives drama that was going on. And it was, uh, it was all we were really talking about. It really caught the industry, you know, um, imagination and attention of like, these are, these are giant icebergs moving through the night. This is not nothing. This is, this is massive. And I think we, even then we all saw that and said, this is before, you know, maybe Google and Gemini said what they had. <clears throat> this is before, for the most part, Facebook had come out and said, we're going to have a open source model called Llama. This isn't before Anthropic and Claude. They already existed. But this is before they had super competitive models, I would say, from what, uh, what we see today. And maybe before your Mistrals and a lot of the open models that are now that are all hybrids and, and slight mixtures and, you know, special, special ingredients of, of this model, and that model and how they're fine tuning them. So when, when you think back to a year ago and, and that whole drama, there were a lot of people that were concerned that that could be, that could be like akin to a natural disaster that just shuts down AI progress for some undetermined amount of time. I remember people talking about it, like what happens tomorrow if open AI isn't still pushing towards this goal, you know, and, uh, would, would Microsoft pick up the, the torch and run? We don't know. It didn't happen like that, but yeah, tr drastic difference in a year from where we were a year ago of what people felt and stuff like that. And now OpenAI is, or rather ChatGPT, since we're talking about its bir second birthday, it's clearly the runaway most used global model or, or tool, AI tool. Um, but that wasn't always necessarily the case. And it wasn't a given that that was the way it was going to go. I just think they've been very good at coming out with new features that are very helpful to the end user not to take anything away from Anthropic and all the amazing stuff they've done in 2024. But I think ChatGPT and OpenAI has still continued, despite all the leaderboards and all that stuff, continued to be the North Star, the guiding light of what is possible and what the upper echelon of these LLMs are. Maybe that won't, maybe they won't keep the crown, but I think they have it securely right now. Yeah. So Sam Altman is a, is a you know, a, string that follows with open ai chat gpt sam altman those three things go together and they're burned into the the minds of anybody who's following ai i think there's some interesting things about sam altman's prehistory to joining open ai uh, you know he didn't just come out of the woods he was he was in a, a, a development and preparation he went to stanford um uh, Stanford, but just for two years, he left in order to start a company in Silicon Valley. Uh, so he studied computer science, 
but he never graduated from college. So this is a high school graduate here we're talking about, one of the most brilliant minds probably now. He's, he's, he's had many, uh, he'll get uh, honorary degrees, I'm sure, from multiple institutions in the future. Uh, but you know, he left Stanford to launch a company. And then after that company, a company called Looped, uh, you know, kind of came into the fore. It was a social mobile application. Uh, it, it, it didn't do particularly well. It never really caught on. Uh, he exited that and joined Y Combinator. Uh, and Y Combinator is like a, a an incubator, uh, an investment incubator, which is the place to go if you really want to start something. Well, he was uh, one of the officials at Y Combinator. So he was exposed to all kinds of different novel ideas, new startups, and helping those startups. And that's the tutelage he had in order to be in a position to run his own little startup, which was OpenAI, at the outset of which it wasn't ever intended to be a for-profit company. It was a non-profit pursuing a very interesting research direction. But th this is a very interesting character, Sam Altman, and no wonder he gets so much attention anytime he does an interview. If you listen to him, this is a very articulate, extemporaneous speaker, really brilliant. Yeah, and I always think it's interesting with him that, like, yeah, I always thought I said this on another show, he looks up and to the left when he's thinking about it. And I almost think like a politician or like a president who knows a lot more than they can publicly share. Like, I always think like, man, his, bra his brain is working overtime because he's always thinking constructively. Not only does he have very intelligent answers, but you just know, like, there's just stuff he cannot he can answer, but he cannot reveal because of where models are and stuff like that. So you always, every time I listen to Sam, I go, it's the stuff he's not saying because, because he can't, because you know, the, the, they're not there yet, or he just doesn't want to release that information. It's always, I suppose it's any major, major CEO or, or executive or whatever, but I don't know. I feel like I see it on his face when he looks up to the left. I go, yeah, he's like, he's real time editing, like. Much he can say filters. He's at it. He's checking up. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did it pass? Did it pass? Okay. It pass? okay. This particular group of words can be yeah. said at this time. Yeah. Well, we are we sure uh, AGI yeah. and a human robot body? <laughs> so, <laughs> he's yeah. long man. That's funny. Um, what was it recently that he was on? An, he was on that interview, a recent interview. Um, and the guy and the, the interviewer said, uh, what are you most excited about? And then pause and then said in 2025, sort of, if you listen to it live, Sam is already starting to say, well, AGI, the interviewer sort of adds 2025 after that. And then he says, well, my husband and I are, are going to have a child that we're expecting and so on and so forth. And so I'm very excited about my family and things like that in 2025. If you read the transcript, it can read like Sam says, open, uh, uh, AGI will come about in 2025. In, in real time, that is not how that conversation goes. But just case in point that everybody is hanging on every last word of his, it hit the news cycle and people said, Sam says AGI comes in 2025. I said, no, he didn't. You know, but like, that's what people saw and they picked up on the transcript and they probably used ChatGPT to summarize something without getting the full context. And so in a very meta way, uh, people used his tools to misinterpret, you know, the, what he was actually probably saying. If you listen to the back and forth to that because of the way the interviewer brought in the in 2025 part of it, you know, just a really interesting thing. But it just goes to show people are hanging on every word he says. So anyway, but let's bring this back to ChatGPT and it actually being two and where that particular tool has uh, has grown from. So, you know, as it stands right now, and by the way, on the in the background, I, uh, you know, you click your mouse and you make it do the auto scroll. Uh, I have had it since we started the show 34 minutes ago. I've had it auto scrolling backwards through my chat history in ChatGPT. We have not reached the bottom of the of the well <laughs> yet. It's still going and thinking very, very hard. Mm -hmm. I think it has decided it has stopped around January of 2023. It does not appear that I can get back farther than that, but we'll see if it goes any farther. Um, but as I list, I, cause I was curious to see what were some of the first things I was asking of the tool, where was my brain on it? Because 
so many of us didn't know what it was capable of. So you just throw more entertainment type level things at it. Like, I don't know, can it write a funny poem to my mom? Yeah, okay, it can do that. Can it Can it make a sing song? I remember my daughter early on using it to uh, help her write a Taylor Swift-esque song, you know, and she was very excited about that, you know, whatever. And she's like, oh, this is really cool. It can give you lyrics and all that. I remember those early cases. But I think a lot of us didn't really truly know and, and perhaps we would say two years later, still do not have a full understanding of the full capabilities of ChatGPT if it was to progress no further than today. So with all that in mind, like, I'd love to hear from you guys. Like, what do you remember about some of the first, first ways you tried to use ChatGPT when it, like in November, December, 2022, as we were all getting into the AI exchange? And then where are you like most excited? I guess the other side I'd be curious is like, where are you most excited about it going? Or maybe the other side of that is like, what's the coolest use case you've used it for today in that two-year period? Do I, I don't know if anybody has an answer. So, so be be before I jump in with my own, um, I think I've heard everybody's in one form or another in previous discussions, but I don't think I've ever heard Aaron's. So Aaron lead us off what, what do you what do you got what's been your experience so i don't think i actually started using chat gpt until i think maybe january or february of 22 was it or 23 when did it start okay. i can't 23 i don't think i even heard about it in sort of the november december part when it started and that i found the ai exchange around that point and then it sort of went from there um, actually i think i was using mid journey before then so for me, I came at it from a, a marketing perspective, and but the thing I was most interested in was, can it write good content? You know, I use that a lot for my work um, and for my clients, and um, I was pretty impressed with that. But it was it was still a limited tool in that you didn't have a big um, uh, a big amount of um, data you could feed into it, or it couldn't. You know, if I wanted to upload an hour long transcript, for example, and have it um do something with it you couldn't do it like you were having to chop things up but it was still pretty impressive and then um i think one of the early things i remember i wrote a i used it to write a piece of poetry which was a really weird situation um and i wrote it for a bunch of retired u.s navy um pilots <laughs> talking about a plane they were interested in and i posted it into a group of i don't know there's a couple multiple hundreds of them and I didn't tell anyone it was written by AI, and everybody was like, wow, we love this. It's awesome. I thought about putting it out on a T-shirt or something one day. But I thought, there is no way in hell I could have ever written that myself. You know, I just yeah. don't have the, that, that skill or that talent or whatever. Since then, it's just gotten better and better. Like, I, I'm, I don't know if you can see back here, you know, some of my books on the shelf. One of the things I remember doing one day, and I don't know if I talked about it on the show or if I just posted in Slack, I just grabbed my phone, went up there, took a photo of a block of books, and just uploaded the photo and said, tell me what the titles and the authors are. And it went through, and I think it only missed one or two, and that blew me away, um, the ability to be able to look at an image and come out with some information about it, which I never expected that quickly. Um the, the voice chat functionality is getting a lot better now. Um, yeah, I still find it glitches occasionally, but it's I love using it uh, just brain dump at it and let it. It's pretty good at transcribing my accent, which usually most of the tools aren't. Um, so it's a good way to do a brain dump and then have it clean it up and make it usable and fresh and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, there's lots of things I can do. Beth and I in particular are both really involved with... Um, um, a guy by the name of Rob Lennon for content writing using um, AI tools and done some amazing things with that. So it's it's a really cool tool as a marketer. I think it's powerful. I think it's going to put me out of a job in the next couple of years if I'm not careful. <laughs> but yeah, love it. Uh, uh, it's it's one of about three subscriptions I don't want to cancel no matter what's going on in my life. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's saying something too, by the way, that in that quick a time it went, I said this to uh, Aaron and uh, then we'll jump to everybody else, but just in response to that, I agree with you. I went from, oh, I'll log into it because it's handy from time to time. 
to oh whatever the pro did we even say when the pro the the paid version pro version came out or whatever i'm not sure but like yeah. then yes this is worth twenty dollars a month all day every day please please uh you know don't raise the rate like this is like the steal of the century to like it never closes in my tab ever the only time i ever log in is when it says your session is expired and it makes me re-log in to the desktop app which always stays yeah. open on my computer like, that's an amazing thing to like people who excuse thousands of go yeah. so just I, the thing i forgot to mention was the ability to upload a like a pdf book for example and talk to it and ask it questions and help it take have it take the knowledge in that and do something for you and i've done that multiple times and that that just blows me away be able to just pile that information in there and i just want them to give us a bigger list space that we can check more stuff in and then i can put 10 books in there and have it do stuff for that so you anyway, know back to you guys so brian you're reminding me of uh of the survey that came out right because you you were allowed to use it for free in the very beginning and then there was a survey that came out and the and the like assumption at that time was that they were looking at forty dollars a month and i remember thinking like i don't know forty dollars a month like that's a lot and when it came out as twenty dollars a month like oh that's half of what I was worried about. Absolutely, no problem. But I remember being like, oh my God, am I going to have to, like, this is a real, like, decision moment in my, like, early life with AI because Dolly, you could buy credits for, right? Like, Dolly had the option that you could just, like, spend money, buy the credits, and so you didn't have to be in a, a, in a regular monthly cycle. You just made me remember that about the twenty dollars. I was like, "Ooh," because because of course it's worth twenty dollars. Because I was trying to convince myself to pay forty. Right, that's an interesting thought, Beth. I I think I would quite happily pay more for more functionality if it ticked the boxes that I wanted. And there's not a lot of um, software stuff that I'm subscribed to that I would say that about. Um, you know, as I think Brian, you said it, it's gone from. I use it occasionally to I use it every day to it's essential to my life almost in two years. I mean, that's really amazing. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't want them to, but they could double the price tomorrow and I wouldn't even blink an eye. Right. I want to clarify that this was in November, uh, December of 2022 that, uh, that this survey was coming out and those decisions were being made. It would be a very different Sorry, sorry, right. I'm, I'm going to do a little pushback here. Uh, uh, don't put that out there. <laughs> I liked the price. Everybody <laughs> said they would quit immediately and never use it again if they raised the price. All right, cool. I mean, going sitting $40 would be a no-go. So, I mean, look, I totally get it. There is a price that everybody's got a price, right? So there's a price where people go, no, you know. I think for me, though, is I'm, I, have, I have a different point of view on it, right? Um, I'm gonna want to try everything. There's so many new things, right? We got to learn what's new out there, put it through its paces and everything like that. So I don't see a $20 price tag. I see an additional $20 price tag, right? It's not just gonna, it's never gonna just be chat GPT for me. It's gonna be chat GPT. It's gonna be Claude. It's gonna be, you know, Gemini. It's got it's gonna be all of those. Now Gemini. now if someone comes up with a great deal to package it together, I hate to use this analogy, but put put together a cable package of every AI model and tool that I can use like that and that interface, uh, that would be fantastic. Can we just like bundle all of the subscriptions and just get a discount because we can do it by volume? That's all, that's all I want. So by API, that exists, right? We know that. It exists by API. But if you're talking about specifically having the access to like chat GPT through a bundle, yeah, that's where the that's where it comes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, of course, there's so many tools like Cassidy and and Jupiter and and God knows all the other ones where you know you go into one central user interface and you have access. Well, perplexity, you have access to multiple models that are at your disposal and you can quickly switch out and back and stuff. So that part exists. But yes, to your point, Jimmy, like there's no bundle of the 
the the the tool the uh the tools with the moats around okay we're we're running short on time here and i know i'm sure we can talk about this forever so let me jump over to uh I, jimmy i think you answered but if you didn't but beth and andy whoever wants to go first so the, just to refresh the question like what do you remember using for initially and then like either what are you excited most about uh going forward or what's your coolest use case for today so uh many of the things that we do when we prompt the llm have to do with a drill down. We're looking for a specific narrow scope of, of, of inquiry. But what I was fascinated by very early on was a simple prompt, which was, tell me what the full range of human knowledge is and organize it encyclopedically, not alphabetically, but rather in terms of the hierarchy of topics that fit into the major domains of human knowledge. And what's amazing is in that training, because these LLMs have been trained in, you know, with trillions and trillions of, uh, of documents, it has all that in there. So it has this expansive view of everything that's out there. And it generated that. And I could then ask it, okay, now in this subject area domain, neuroscience, Show me what the list of all the subtopics of that are. Zip, like in a second, it generates that. So it has a way of organizing anything you want to think about in a hierarchical way. And that's just something that I you know, was astounded by back then. Never had that sort of thing. I'm the kind of guy who wanted an Encyclopedia Britannica when I was young because I said, I'm going to read the whole thing. Well, of course, I never cracked one of those books, but... Uh, Anyway, that, that's the amazing thing for that. But uh, going forward, it's the um, you know, real-time conversational open socket connection that was just released. Really, what, what was the date when they, uh, you know, it was just October that OpenAI made available this real-time advanced voice mode interaction with the AI. And, and getting to voice interaction with intelligence is really what I think the promise of the future is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will jump in just quickly, mine, so then we can end with you, Beth. I will just say that uh, the scrolling has stopped. It will no longer go any farther. So what I did was, uh, it's not the beginning. There's no way, because the prompt that I'm looking at as the very bottom prompt um, is way too complex. And there's no way I was writing prompts like this. It doesn't have the act as a markdown, but it's it's not my even close to my first prompt. There's no chance. So I don't know how far much farther back could go, but the spinny wheel will not go any farther back. So what I did do is highlight everything on the left side of everything it had loaded, threw it into a new chat GPT uh, question, and it said roughly how many conversations of this. And it just came back and says, it appears there's well over 500 conversations here. And like I said, we're nowhere near the bottom of the well. It just won't load anything else. <laughs> its memory is tapped. It won't go farther back, which is kind of sad because I'd like to kind of know where it started. But uh, at the same time, I get it. Like me plus whatever, 100 million other people plus, 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 you know, holding everybody's memory of every single chat they ever did in ChatGPT is a large task. So uh, I just wanted to throw that in there. I don't know what my first one was, but I do remember it had something to do with like rapping and, and rhyming schemes and probably poetry in that sense, because that's what was a lot of what was in the, the social media and stuff. Like, oh, check this out, check that. I kind of like what you said, Aaron. So that was probably the first thing I did. I know I showed it to my daughter almost immediately and was like, check this out. And I've said this before that what I really remember both with Dolly 2 and ChatGPT was that my daughter, who, you know, would have been 12 at the time, immediately was better at using both tools. And it was clear to me that her openness to creativity as a child does and seeing through child eye actually made her better at using both tools. And it was, a, I really had took a step back and thought from a dead stop, me and a 12 year old and she immediately was getting better responses and better images because she was not constrained by 30 plus more years of, whole, you know, SEO and Google. She was, she didn't have any of that. And it just really opened my eyes to the idea of like, be more flexible, be more open, be more open and accepting to the idea of the possibilities like a 12 year old would, because she clearly was getting better 
results immediately out of the gate. I just thought that was so fascinating to me. That's what I remember most about it more than anything. So I'll stop with that share and then Beth, take us home here with yours. All right. So I've told this story before, but one of the first things that I used um, ChatGBT for was to help populate my Salesforce uh, portfolio org. And my portfolio org was based on the Buffy the Vampire Slayer universe. And the Buffy the Vampire Slayer universe was in the training data because that, like, it was all already there. So uh, I did a bunch of things of like, okay, you and I are in the writing room of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer universe. What are, uh, give me 10 people who live in Sunnyvale, right? Like, or Sunnydale. Um uh, and like, what are the, cause it's Salesforce, like, what are the, uh, what are the categories of products that you could buy in the magic box? Right. So I was just going through and like, ha yeah. uh, getting like, what are some street names in, uh, in the town? Like it was really fun to be able to just go back and forth about that kind of brainstorm. What I use it now for, I tend to use O1 mini for higher level, uh, planning. And when I have a really big project, then I go to O1 preview and, uh, and get that. So yeah. uh, that's what we got today. Brian, take us out. Yeah, that's it. We'll wrap it up today and for this week. Thanks for everybody hanging out with us. As I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, go to the dailyishow.com not only to get more information about the show, but you can sign up directly for the newsletter. Uh, that will go out, when, um, excuse me, Sunday morning, as I mentioned. Um, and I bit my tongue and I did not share everything because I wanted you guys to see some of the other cool stuff that comes up in the did you know as well as another section that uh andy kind of kicked off for us those are both in the newsletter they have not come up on the show i guarantee you uh so um you know if you're interested in the kind of conversations we're having here that's the logical next place for you to go obviously it doesn't cost anything we don't sell anything to you on it like it's just another resource for you if you enjoy these types of conversations so make sure you like and subscribe if you could do that those those help us tremendously on every one of the videos as well as helping our grow our audience but obviously the newsletter is there as an additional resource to you if you kind of like uh talking about ai like we do with that we'll wrap it up for the week uh, and we will be back next Monday, uh, next Monday for five more shows next week. And we will keep rocking and rolling as we uh, quickly grow to our 400th episode, which will be coming up, um, if not December, pretty quick. So that's it for us today, guys. Have a great weekend. And um, we will see you again on Monday. Till then. Bye.